Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. Where tonight we're going to take a dive into some of those second semester calculus concepts. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI Technology to make those tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. Tonight we're really lucky to be joined by our two panelists, Vicki Carter and Tony Record. Vicki's been teaching high school math for only 46 years at West Florence High School. She's a former co-chair of the AP Calculus Development Committee and served as an assistant chief reader at the... Vicki, you're gonna have to fill me in there, actually, that got cut off. Uh, I believe it was the 2021 and 2020 reading. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> um, and she received the T Cube Leadership Award in 2015, and she has served on TI Inspire authoring teams and has presented at many national, state, and local conferences. So, Vicki, thanks for uh, keeping me honest there, and it's great to have you with us. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone tonight. And Tony has been a math teacher at Avon High School, a western suburb of Indianapolis for the past 32 years. And for the past 22 of those, Tony has been primarily teaching AP Calculus and has worked to build his school's AP Calculus program to nearly 300 students. In addition to being a T-Cube regional instructor, Tony is an active consultant with the College Board, having produced several AP Live and AP Daily lessons and trained teachers in 27 states. He has authored the AP Calculus AB curriculum for the KIPP charter school system across the United States and has written several test prep materials for various print and online publishers such as Propel Enterprises, Albert.io, and Getify.com. He lives in Avon, Indiana with his wife and two teenage children, and in his spare time, he loves to play guitar, is active with the Central Indiana's Hendrix Civic Theater, having appeared in several productions. So, Tony, it's great to have you with us as well. Thank you, Mike. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure, as always, to, to be with you tonight. And Tony, will you mind talking through some of those agenda items for tonight for us? Yeah, certainly. Uh, tonight, we plan on uh, just once again, kind of uh, picking up where Vicki and I may have left off in our fall webinar, uh, overview of the course and exam description. We'll kind of show you where we are all hoping to be here in the next uh, uh, weeks or so, if we're not there already. And then from that course and exam description, uh, we're going to share several activities, actually, uh, that are both paper-born and technology-born that you could use uh, in your classrooms right away. Uh, that will involve both the TI-84 and the Inspire models. We're also going to have a little segment today, uh, just a takeaway from uh, last year's operational AP exam. That would be the May 4th administration. And we're going to take a look at ABBC1. We'll give you a hint. It involves bacteria in a dish. And then rumor has it, we're gonna have a webinar drawing. So for those of you that stick around until the end, um, I think one of you is gonna walk away with a Texas Instrument graphing calculator of your choice. So there you go. Thanks so much, Tony. And Vicki, uh, would you mind discussing what are the expected outcomes for tonight? So we hope that you will be able to use the resources that we go over to strengthen your calc your students' um, calculator use on the CED with, with the AP Calculus exam. And also um, help them review and get ready for their exam in 2022 by looking at the 2021 AB1 BC1 question that does involve technology. Awesome. So we're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free to send any questions to Tony or Vicki by using that Q&A window on the right side of your screen. And we'll also be using the chat window tonight to send general messages. As a reminder, the session is being recorded, and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the event. All right, Tony, you have control. Feel free to share your screen. All right. Sounds good. So. As you probably already know by now, we're going to be diving into integration, differential equations, and the applications of integrals in AP Calculus. And uh, I'm going to have Vicki kind of talk a little bit about uh, kind of 
where we are, what the focus is going to be, and you're going to see something that might look a little familiar here to you. So, Vicki, what do you think here? So, we decided to focus on those units that, uh, for a lot of people, occur during second semester, but what happens after they've learned their derivatives and how to apply their derivatives to things such as related rate problems, motion problems, uh, optimization, uh, graphical analysis, et cetera, since we covered a lot of those in the session that we did in the fall. So our big focus tonight is unit six, seven, and eight. Of course, these unit numbers may not correspond with your chapters in your textbook, but we hope everyone becomes very familiar with the CED and you know exactly what students are expected to know. So unit six is um, basically starts with your Riemann sums and then goes into what is a definite integral. Then we go into basically antiderivative processes, uh, U sub, um, uh, the long division and completing the squares, one of the things that is called out there. We're not going to do any of that tonight because that's more of a algebraic manipulative type thing, but we are going to look at Riemann sums and definite integrals. Then unit seven with your differential equations, um, of course, they're continuing to use their antiderivative techniques in that unit. And then unit eight is a huge one with the applications of integration. It includes uh, looking at motion problems from the integration side of things and area volume and several other things things in between. All right, sounds good. And we're going to kick things off with uh, what we call a rate in, rate out kind of problem, a rate in, rate out activity. And if you've been around the block for a while and you've uh, been teaching AP calculus, you probably realize that the rate in, rate out problem is sort of a staple of each year's uh, uh, operational exam and alternate exams. And typically, you're going to see this problem in a free response question. And I, I want to uh, give a, a great shout out to uh, a gentleman that many of you uh, probably know either personally or, or by name, Mark Corrali, a wonderful teacher from Denton, Texas, authored this um, really fascinating activity. I think it's very immersive that really kind of uh, hones in what the, the skill set is for the rate in and rate out activity. And uh, these activities are all available for you um, uh, at the 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 at the webinar uh, portal where you can download those and, and use those. And then Vicki and I are also going to share uh, a website with you at the end of the broadcast here that will uh, allow you to find these in addition. So I know that this is a little hard to read. You're probably squinting your eyes and thinking, what? Um, a circuit, uh, as many of you might know, is sort of like a scavenger hunt. You would work through the activity starting in the upper left box, solve that problem, and then look for that answer elsewhere in the activity, and then just kind of continue um, until you finish it. This is actually a, it's called a circuit with a twist. Mark likes to call this a Mobius training because it has two separate circuits. It has a smaller circuit inside of it. And so the problem that we're gonna focus on here is this guy here in the uh, lower right-hand corner of the first page. And you're now hopefully gonna be able to read this as it's a little bit bigger on your screen. So it says from the time of facility processing uh, from the time of facility processing sand for sandboxes opens, sand is brought in at a constant rate of 500 pounds per hour. Sand is filtered, sanitized, and packaged. The play sand ships out to a, at a rate modeled by the given function s of t is 395 minus 2t times the cosine of one half t. T is measured in hours and S is in pounds per hour. How much sand has been shipped four hours after the facility is open? Very traditional read in that you're provided with this rate and we're asked in this particular instance to find a total amount. And so one of the things that we would like our students to, to discover very early in unit six is that if you integrate the rate, you'll get this total amount. And it's kind of nice because that rhymes. Sometimes we use that sort of mnemonic in our classrooms. So what are we looking at specifically here from a student work standpoint? Well, we obviously want them to perform this antiderivative on this rate to turn it into that total amount. But we also need to make sure that they're very aware of our limits of integration. And this is sort of a catch-all model in that it's not stated whether or not it starts at a specific time zero. So we just interpret this as being good for all time. 
And the fact that we want to find this amount four hours after the opening agrees with the fact that we're going to integrate from zero to four. Now, we're going to use a couple of different pieces of technology. I am going to, first of all, start with the TI Inspire. And I'm just going to work from a simple scratch pad for this particular problem, just to remind folks how you would use the Inspire technology to uh, perform this definite integral. And then, of course, we're going to switch over to the TI-84 a little love here in just a moment. So many of you might be aware that on the TI Inspire, the probably quickest way to bring up a definite integral is your shift plus. All the fields are there. We just enter our values, 0 to 4. This particular function, 395 minus 2. You can really use really whatever variable that you want. We're going to stick with the ones that are in the problem, t. I want to kind of point something out for some of the Inspire users to kind of caution you. If we move right to our trig word, which in this case was cosine, we will have a bit of a problem there. If you see this cosine hasn't been kind of uh, recognized as being a trigonometric function. So a lot of times it's important to understand that the implied multiplication that we want to be there isn't really recognized by the machine. So once we put that multiplication, you can see that that cosine turns from italics to normal font and it is now recognized. Uh, a lot of times uh, my students learn that the hard way and I have also learned that the hard way uh, when I haven't been paying attention. We're going to use our uh, argument one half t, and of course, with respect to t. Now, just to show you, this is a cast model. So if we do hit enter, the calculator will tend to show off a little bit. That answer would be acceptable on an AP exam. Uh, it's probably not going to work real well for the purpose of this circuit. And so, of course, we could hit control enter to convert that to a decimal. Uh, of course, if you're using the numeric Inspire, it's going to likely go straight to that decimal. And another quick shortcut, if you wanted to go straight to that decimal answer right away, on your entry, if you just had a decimal point anywhere, doesn't matter which of these values, once you hit enter, it'll go straight to the decimal answer. And Something Tony, else. one thing, yes. yeah, mm -hmm. Tony, I want to mention one other thing. So everyone, um, I hope, that is teaching AP Calculus knows that we, when we have a decimal presentation of an answer with the calculator active questions, they need to have accuracy for three decimal places. If you notice here, we don't have three decimal places. And so I always caution my students to highlight the answer and press enter so that they can see additional decimal places and make sure they are presenting that accuracy, either rounded or truncated, with the third place after the decimal point. Perfect. She beat me to it. That's I'm so sorry. Important. Oh, you are <laughs> fine. And, and it's interesting because out of the box, out of the packaging, the Inspire is set to float six. And so if a student does have a four digit prior to a decimal, they're likely just going to see the two digits after the decimal unless they change those settings. And so Vicki nailed it. Perfect way to do it is just to highlight, hit enter, and then you probably have more decimals than you care to, to, to use at that point. So uh, if we go back to the document here, um, hopefully we can report that answer. And as we said, we do want that to be expressed to three places. Now, in this case, since that third decimal is a zero, we would assume that to be a zero if the student stopped at the eight. Uh, but it's a good practice, I think, for students to always express those three digits no matter what. And I think in our particular problem here, our units would be pounds. So I'm going to go back to this wonderful document here, and let's take a look at another one uh, that Mark wrote. This is in the bottom right corner. It has a few more things kind of at stake. So if I call upon it, it reads a spherical tank of benzene is being filled at a rate modeled by the function f of t is one fifth t squared minus six times the sine of one half t minus three plus four. And our range is going to be from t, uh, t being from zero to 10. At t equal two, the tank starts leaking benzene at a rate modeled by g of t as e to the cosine of t plus seven with a time interval two to 10. Both f of t and g of t are measured in liters per hour. T is in hours. What is the volume of the tank at t equal 10 in liters if the initial amount of benzene in the tank 
was 100 liters. So there's a little bit more going on here. We still have given rates, and I often tell my students, these may not look like rates, but don't be fooled. They're going to act like them. They don't have a prime mark on them, but we want to treat them as such. And so if we do take the antiderivative along some given boundaries, we realize that these are going to spit out total amounts. So first of all, for a student setup, we're thinking if we want to find the total amount A that's filled, we would integrate our N rate, which is our F of T in this equation. And it is going to be valid from time zero to time 10. And the reason why we want to stop at 10 is because we want to know that volume specifically at 10. That value there is going to dictate what our upper boundary is going to be. And while we're at it, we have a very similar process we're going to follow for the amount that leaked. But do you see the little trick here? It's so important that students read and reread the text. This leak did not start until time two. So obviously that can be a bit tricky. And that's what's really nice about a circuit. Because let's say a student did accidentally put a zero here. They're going to find that their answer is incorrect because it won't match anything else in the circuit. And hopefully they think to go back to the drawing board and, and think about what happened. Now, let's go ahead and use some technology to calculate these two. Uh, as I said before, we're going to take a look at the TI-84 here. And this is the, uh, the plus CE model, but your 84 silver editions, uh, things, uh, calculators like that, that have uh, the newer operating system upgrade should still give you the math nine that we all know and love to be our definite interval. We input our boundaries zero to 10. And we're going to use that function one fifth. So fraction would be alpha y equal option one, one over five. Now, if you recall, our function was in terms of t. It's probably best with the inspire that we stick with x. It's just a little bit easier to work with that. We're going to square him. And then we were subtracting six times the sign. Notice we don't need the implied multiplication. Uh, the, the calculator will recognize it between a constant. And I think we're looking at 1 half t minus 3. There's our 1 half. And remember, for t, I'm going to use x minus 3. This is actually a very interesting point in the problem, because there's another plus 4 outside of that one half x minus three. And sometimes students have a difficult time making that happen. And it's amazing sometimes what a little parenthesis click can do. And now we have our justified parentheses. We can add that plus four that we need. And there we go. And whoops, and you can probably tell, I, I'd like to say I did that on purpose. We definitely need to fill in this differential. Otherwise the, uh, the uh, 84 won't quite understand what's going on. And there's our result, 113.552 to three decimal places. And then just briefly, I'm going to do the same. Now you might wonder, would this be a problem that would benefit us maybe defining these functions, working with them maybe several times? Well, I think we're gonna have a problem later on, I, I believe Vicki uh, will share with you, where that's going to be something that's probably a little bit more worth our while. If you're just gonna be typing these functions in one time, you might as well just type them in the one time here in the workspace. All right, we have an X here, I believe, and get out of that exponent spot, add seven, make sure I give my differential, and we should hopefully get a, an answer that's going to work for us. I'm gonna take us back to our document at this point, and we see that indeed our setup is now gonna take a slight turn here. We know that we want A of 10, the amount at time 10. And one thing I really like about this particular problem is it, again, forces the students to understand that we had this initial amount. A lot of textbooks, and I know in, in the notes that, that, that I use that, that you will all have access to, I like to call this the net change formula. Your starting amount plus the amount in minus the amount out. And if you recall from the calculator, 
we had those values that 113 and some change, the 64 and some change to give us a final result of 148.581. And I double checked, that matches one of the answers in the circuit. So a wonderful activity. Uh, you could use this really anytime after topic 6.5 and 6.4, I think it fits in unit six very nicely. It also fits really well in unit eight especially in 8.3 when we're talking about accumulation models uh, in AP Calculus. Personally, I like to do this both times. I introduce it while I'm in Unit 6, and then I hit it a little harder in Unit 8 because I know it's so prominently featured on the AP exam. Vicki's going to take it away now and talk about a wonderful activity that she wrote for you. So in the past few years, it's been a little difficult for having students uh, sitting in groups and working, and that was what I did for years and years. So this current school year, I have plastered various things all, all over my walls that give me um, whiteboard surfaces for students to get up and work, and I usually send them to these surfaces in groups of two, sometimes three, but two is working really well when they have to talk about a calculus problem. One of the other things that we see with the AP exam is that students sometimes get hung up in problems where it's not as involved as what we just looked at, It's um, and it primarily happens with these motion problems. Uh, they they kind of forget to write the setup down on the AP exam and then carry through the calculation. And we get what we refer to sometimes as a bald answer. And that bald answer does not earn very much credit because we need to see the setup. So I decided when I was working in, in topic um, 8.2, which is where we visit a second time motion problems, position, velocity, acceleration, but this time with integrals, that what I would have my students go up and do is to take a problem and um, show their setup first, don't touch the calculator, and I made them do all four parts, A, B, C, and D, and they had to write the setup down, and then once I so-called approved it, gave it an okay, and it was real easy to do this walking around the room when they were working on the whiteboards on the walls and everything. I could see a lot of problems um, as the students were working on them at one time, and then after they got their approval for their setup, then they would actually go to their calculator, and I had each student compute on their calculator to make sure it wasn't one of these cases where the kid who's good with the calculator was doing everything and then they got their calculator decimal response and wrote it down and then I would again check their work and I had um, four problems that I had them do problem one is kind of a new problem that I just wrote myself problems two three and four are actually versions of motion problems that have been on previous exams that are released questions and I kind of changed them to make them more, uh, more prominently the, the integration techniques, although there are a few uh, differentiation things that we did along the way, and that was kind of intended to help them review a little bit and know when to do a derivative and when to do an integral. So we're going to look at problem three. And uh, for this problem, we have uh, on the interval from 0 to 6, a particle is moving along the x-axis. The particle's position, x of t, is not explicitly given. The velocity of the particle is given by this uh, sine function that also involves an exponential. Uh, and then we gave them the acceleration function, and that was, as I tell my students, sort of to level the playing field so that a student didn't lose points here for not knowing the acceleration or not knowing how to deal with, um, how to find the acceleration. We also told them the position at zero was two. So question A is kind of a derivative question, and this is one that I threw in just for review. Is the speed of the particle increasing or decreasing at time t equals 5.5? Give a reason for your answer. So what I was hoping the students would remember is that they needed to calculate both V of 5.5 and A of 5.5 in order to come up with whether the particle speed was increasing or decreasing. So that's what I was expecting to see them write on their whiteboards. And so then 
question or part B, find the average velocity. So this is topic 8.1 where we find the average value of a function. And so there have been a lot of questions where a table was given and the students are asked for an average rate of change and they really confuse average rate of change and average velocity or, or average value of a function. So in this case, I was hoping that they would set up the, the average value of the velocity over that interval from zero to six. And then we have a total distance traveled that would involve the absolute value of V of T. And then we have a position and the students quickly realize after we look at topic 8.1 and the one that was um, that Tony just mentioned from unit six and then 8.3, which is accumulation functions with integration, that position is kind of working just like that problem we looked at a few minutes ago where to find, and I always call it, I say something like this. If we want a new position, what we need to do is take the old position and add the displacement. And so that was the setup that I was hoping to see. So Tony, let's move to the next screen. I think that shows um, our speed. And so here's Tony's going to click his mouse and show what I was expecting to see. So I actually didn't expect the values to be there initially, but eventually to see those values, I stressed again the representing those values with three decimal places, either correct, rounded, or truncated. And then I wanted to see that the speed was increasing because both the velocity and the acceleration had the same sign. They were both negative. Um, students forget this. They forget that this is how we determine whether the speed is increasing or decreasing, and they want to rely on acceleration only. And it's very enticing to do because the acceleration function was given in this problem. But let's look at part B because this is more on our integration techniques. So our setup I was hoping to see was one over six minus zero, definite integral from zero to six of V of T dt. Once I saw that, then I allowed them to use their calculator and find their response. And it was 1.949. Total distance traveled. It's very important that they put the absolute value into their integrand with the velocity and then do their calculation here. And um, then part D, find the position. So as I said earlier, I strongly encourage my students to write it this way, that the X of six is X of zero plus the definite integral from zero to six of V of T dt. So Tony, I think we're going to uh, look at this um, on one of the calculators. Sounds good. Which, which one would you like? Uh, let's, let's stay with the 84 for right now. Okay. okay. So if you recall, we had that initial position that two that we'll yes. add, and then we're going to do the magic of math nine, and our boundaries is zero to six. And if you recall, the, uh, the V of T equation was the first equation given, and that was that two sign. I know most of you probably don't have the document in front of you, but it was two sine of E to the T divided by four. And so again, once you're in this exponent's position, um, I think we just uh, would use X. And then you don't always have to access that fraction template. Sometimes it's a little bit quicker to access it via the diagonal uh, division bar. And then we got our DX. And, and I'm looking at this thinking, um, I forgot to add the one. See, it happens, right? <laughs> Um, well, you know what? I almost said something about it because it looked like the last problem where if you aren't very observant and students need to be very careful about that um, when they look at the AP exam, like, is there a little plus one or minus 10 or something at the end of that function that they needed to include? For certain, yeah. You know, the, the, the calculator is obviously going to provide them a, a, a very <laughs> a strong degree of accuracy, but it also comes at that kind of cognizant stage where that price where they have to really be careful that they're typing in exactly what's on the screen. 
And so well, the nice thing about when I use this activity and I did use it with my BC class, someone asked if I teach AB or BC. So we have already covered this concept um, in BC, but we're we're quite a ways away in my AB class. Um, is that when they reported this value, let's say they did what you did, Tony, and put the wrong value up on the whiteboards was out as I was walking around, then I would say, show me your calculator. Let's find what's wrong. I mean, we even find sometimes that somehow a calculator has inadvertently um, been placed into degree mode, and we stop and talk about that because this that would be an issue with this particular problem with our trig function in it. And so it, it allows to have really good conversations with the kids and they aren't um they aren't under the pressure of that test taking feeling when they're working with activities such as this and i think it's a really good learning experience for the students yeah thanks vicky great activity we're going to segue now and talk a little bit about a particular problem from the may 4th administration uh, many of you or your students may have elected to do uh, the first administration last year. I know last year was a little bit different. Uh, the last two years have been a little bit different. But we had a, a, a an early administration uh, pencil and paper. We had a later administration pencil and paper. And then uh, there was an online only administration. So this is that ABBC1, the density of bacteria population in a Petri dish. and. Um, I'm, I'm just going to read the question, paraphrase it somewhat quickly here. You were given a table, of course, and the density of a bacteria population in a circular Petri dish at a distance r centimeters from the center of the dish was given by this increasing differentiable function f. f of r is measured in milligrams per square centimeter. Values for f of r for selected r are given in the table. Now, the first part, use the data in the table to estimate f prime of 2.25 use correct units, interpret the meaning of your answer in the context. Pretty standard question that we see from time to time. It's definitely more of a first semester type of question than it is a unit six, seven, or eight. And then in part B, they were going to compute the total mass in milligrams. This definitely segues a little bit more into what our focus is on this evening. And we had to use an approximation to find two pi integration from zero to four of R f of R using a right Riemann sum. And I think I just heard some collective calculus teachers just say, oh yeah, I remember that, the R F of R. So we're gonna take a look at this setup here in a moment. Part C was um, a very challenging part, we'll go into detail with, is the approximation found in part B an overestimate or an underestimate of the total mass of the bacteria in the Petri dish? Explain your reasoning. And then part D, very calculator intensive, the density of the bacteria for time uh, for radius one to four is modeled by a different function g given here and we're going to find what value of k between one and four is g of k equal to the average value of g of r so for part a the model solution uh, would look something like this it was worth two points in order for students to earn the first point and calculate or approximate this derivative it's very key that we understand that we're looking for a difference quotient. So a bald answer of eight would not be acceptable. Uh, an answer of four over 0.5 just by itself would not be acceptable as well. We need to see this difference quotient. So if a student wrote this, they're certainly on their way, but even that alone would not be enough to earn the point because we have to pull values from the table. Now, let's say that a student only wrote this and say nothing else appears. That would be enough to earn that first estimate point. Now, if a student said four over 0.5, but had that previous difference quotient, the f of 2.5 minus f of two over 2.5 minus two, that would be enough together to earn the point. And as we all know, or at least most of us probably know, that you don't ever have to simplify. So the value eight uh, was really not of any consequence to it. Uh, now, if they did simplify, they had to simplify it correctly. Now, the second point, a little bit, little bit more at stake here in terms of what the student has to say. 
They have to use correct units and interpret the meaning of this answer. And so there are really three things that we're looking for here. Maybe some of you use the acronym NUT, N-U-T in your class. And I know there's several other amazing acronyms that I've heard that sometimes I forget. Uh, noun, units, time. If you can invoke those three elements in your explanation, you probably have done a good job. Now, the time is a little elusive here because I don't think that the radius 2.25 centimeters is necessarily a time, but it's like an instance. It's like a moment in this experiment uh, that's measured in radius. So we have to have that. We have to have the density of the bacteria population. That's sort of acting as your noun. And I always tell my students that the noun is also like the, the subject of the sentence, which means we might want a verb to accompany it. And that verb could certainly be increasing. We will also accept changing. What we won't accept is that phrase that's underlined without the word density. And many students fell victim to that. The bacteria population is not what is increasing. That's not reflective of the data that's in the table. That data is a measure of the density. And so that was really interesting. It really invokes mathematical practice four in the CED about communication. And then of course, our answer eight. And if you don't put the units with your first answer, you need to put the units down in the explanation. You can put it in both places for sure. And that units would be milligrams per square meter per, cent uh, I'm sorry, milligrams per square centimeter per centimeter. Uh, and that was a very tricky units for kids. I know, uh, I remember from the reading. Uh, milligrams per cubic centimeters is correct. Um, milligrams per milliliters, oddly enough, would be correct because a cubic centimeter is a milliliter. I would venture to say those students probably did very well on their AP science exams. We move to part B. This is where things started to get interesting. If you recall, the students were asked to approximate the value of this definite integral, and they were using a right Riemann sum with the four subintervals. The part that threw students for a loop was this R. And I will be the first to admit in my classroom, I don't ever recall working a Riemann sum problem where the students had that uh, value, that variable within their function that they were approximating the, the area for. Now, the setup is pretty traditional outside of that R. Our right Riemann sum means we are going to use the R values 1, 2, 2.5, and 4, respectively. And we're going to use their uh, appropriate widths, which aren't equivalent, right? We have a difference in width here of 1, 1, and this one is a 1 half. And that would be, I believe, a 1.5 eventually. And so students need to be alert that you don't necessarily want to assume that you can always factor out a common width. And then what about that R? Well, that R just happens to go along for the ride. There's our one, our two, our 2.5, and our four that comprise that R. Now, as far as um, the first point, earning the first point, um, I would be a liar if I said a large, population of students forgot the R altogether, but they did a good job in setting up a right Riemann sum. So with the absence of the R in that setup, you would still be able to earn the first point. And after all, I think that's fair because the students demonstrated they know what a right Riemann sum is. Of course, they're not going to earn the approximation answer point. Another issue that might be worth noting, students can make one mistake typically in a Riemann sum setup. So let's say I wrote four minus two here on accident. That would still be enough to earn the first point as long as no other errors were made. And of course, the approximation point would be sacrificed. Anyway, you would either be able to express this unsimplified or simplified either in terms of pi or a decimal to earn that second point. Part C is where things really went awry. It was very difficult for students to effectively communicate what it means for the approximation, in this case, to be an overestimate. Even really bright students who are on top of things that thought, oh, if the function increases, 
on a right Riemann sum, I have an over approximation. And that's always true. The problem is, what function are we talking about? And so it was extremely important that the students specifically state the function r times f of r. They had to state that that was increasing and that would lead to the overestimate. Now that would only earn one of the two points. We still need to know how does the student know that r f of r is increasing? And that would come from your first semester, whoops, I'm gonna go back here, the first semester of using the product rule here with r f of r and then just taking note that f of r, the values in the table are clearly positive. r is a measure of radius, it's clearly positive. And the f prime of r, well, if we look up here, it says that f of r or the function f is increasing, which means that f prime would also have to be positive. So if you add all of this positive stuff together, you're going to stay positive. Very tough part, a lot of students, it, it took quite a few samples before we could see some nines in this problem. And most of it was due to part C. Now part D is very calculator intensive. And the good thing is it's very much in line with some of the things that Vicki and I have already uh, spoken to you about tonight. Uh, we're asked to find the value of K for which G of K was equal to the average value of the function. So in this particular instance, the student would <clears throat> have to first of all recognize that the average value of a function from unit eight, topic two, is our one over B minus A integrate from A to B. And so they would have to enter this into their calculator. Now, as far as uh, scoring is concerned, a student would not have to actually report that answer. And that answer turns out to be this 9.875. Okay. We didn't ask for what the average value was. That problem could have been, or that particular value could have been stored completely in the calculator. But we did have to see what they are going to use with this. Okay, So to kind of recap, if all a student wrote is this right here or this up here and nothing more, that is two points. They get one point for knowing to use a definite integral with the boundaries one and four, and then by dividing by the four minus one, that gets them to the average value. Now the final point is a matter of setting this integration equivalent to that 9.8. And I'm gonna go ahead and do this on the TI-84 here. And uh, this is gonna be a problem that we're gonna definitely wanna visit our graphing screen. And that particular function, uh, if I recall, was two minus, 16 times the quantity. We've got our cosine coming up. We definitely want to use x here. Uh, let's let's probably use x instead of that arrow. And then we're going to finish off uh, with. Uh, actually, I don't want that x yet. I need to pay attention to the problem. It's the cosine of 1.57 times the square root of x. Okay, and then I want to close out some parentheses here, close out the argument of the cosine, and then I want this entire cosine uh, or this entire expression uh, involving the cosine cubed, which means I need another parenthesis before I raise it to that third power. And to raise to a power, we are going to hit the caret button. And so Tony has pointed out something really important that he had to pay attention to what he is typing in. And he's a fairly, you know, well-versed user of both types of calculators. Students are going to need to practice these kinds of things with their calculators to be proficient when it comes time for the AP exam. Exactly. And then in our Y2, this is where we can enter that value that we got from computing the definite integral. Now, I didn't show that to you on the calculator because you've seen it quite a few times already this evening, but I'll type that in correctly this time, 9.8757. That certainly would give us uh, enough decimal accuracy. Now we're gonna go to our graph. Hopefully I'm in a standard window and I'm not quite in a standard window, <laughs> but I'm in a very lucky window because it does show uh, the intersections that we're 
that we are seeking here. Now, we actually see two points of intersection, but if you recall the problem, and I don't mind, I'll bring that up again, that problem wants this value to fall between one and four. So it's another instance where the students might be kind of directing their eyes right back to uh, the stem of the problem. And then to calculate this intersection point, we would go into second trace, second calc, choose option five, intersect. It's gonna ask us who our curves are. There's only two, so they'll default to the first one entered, hit enter. The second one, Y2, sounds good to me, hit enter. And then for our guess, all we really need to do is move this a little close. And the closer you get, the more nanoseconds you're going to save. That's probably going to work there for us. And that's the answer that we wanted, the 2.497. It might be interesting to note, those of you that are TI Inspire users, maybe you TI Inspire CAS users, uh, Vicki and I strongly agree, and we both have used CAS in our classrooms, that we still would like our CAS students to probably graph that equation. We've been burned before in the past, I think, Vicki, when uh, a solve feature with CAS functionality doesn't quite give us the results that we want. Yes, as a matter of fact, it, it can just take time, and the students, as you well know, are timed on these first two free response questions for, they have a total of 30 minutes, which averages about 30, uh, 15 minutes per question, but they certainly don't need to sit there and watch their calculator spin waiting for a result when the graph could have given it to them very quickly. Exactly. Summing up this particular exam, you see all of the mean scores there. I know it might be easy to kind of feel depressed by that, but you have to keep in mind that the, the, the standard uh, distribution of scores one through five were very much on par with previous years. Uh, we know that this exam is difficult and these mean scores on the free response questions do look a little low and that's where we were on the bacteria problem, right? Um, hey, at least it wasn't the spinning top problem, right? <laughs> which was number three there, which is a, a story for another webinar. And on the BC exam, the students were uh, probably a little bit better, I would say, at 3.12 uh, with their average there. And we would expect that from our BC students, of course. So we are now going to just spend a few moments just introducing you or maybe reintroducing you to some, some of our more favorite uh, Inspire activities that can be found. Uh, some of these can be found on the TI website. You're all going to be able to access them through the uh, portal of the webinar and you can download them. This is one of my personal favorites. I know some of you might use this, the Riemann Sum uh, program. I This is always my go-to whenever I want my students to see these Riemann Sums in a very quick, efficient fashion. And so if you haven't seen this before, basically what we've got here is um, a document or a program, I should say, that allows a lot of student uh, interaction. They can interact with the function, the left end point A, the right end point B, the number of figures in denoted by another slider, and then the different type of Riemann sums, left, midpoint, and right, along with the trapezoid method. And so page 1.3, where all the magic happens right there. The default function is x squared minus 3x plus 4. See how we can move our boundaries any way that we would like. And down here we see a verification that they are currently at one and four. It's already doing some calculations for us, probably not a very accurate Riemann sum with one rectangle, so we can add more to it. And then we can see the magic of uh, the left endpoint coming to life. If we wanna segue this really quickly to a right endpoint, we just drag this slider and everything dynamically is calculated, the approximation. Notice that exact area, not really changing, right? Now, if you follow the CED or you like to teach Riemann sums before you integrate, students are gonna be like, how are you getting that exact area? So it might be kind of nice to plant that seed to let them start thinking about, now there must be a way. We have a wonderful midpoint representation. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but these are hard to hand draw on the board. And then of course, you've got your trapezoid rule. And one thing that we wanna point out, and I've said this many times, and, and I know Vicki agrees, I know Mike agrees as well. A lot of folks say, well, I'm, I'm entrenched in the TID4, which is a wonderful machine. It's going to 
do wonders for you and your students come exam day. But you really wish that you had the functionality or the capability to maybe use something like this. You can still use the teacher presentation software. You can use teacher or even student software for that matter to bring these programs into your classroom and demonstrate them in front of your students. I know firsthand, I was a TI 83 plus user for four years after the Inspire software was released, and I used the Inspire software to demo to my students as they were using the TI-84+. And since then, we've now graduated to the TI-Inspire uh, calculators. And just so you know, I don't want to belabor this, but you could type in any kind of fun little thing here. I don't know. Um, I might be putting myself on the spot here, but I'm going to try two natural log of, now I'm nervous, uh, how about just X minus uh, E? Oh, what the heck? Let's go trig. Sine of X plus <laughs> four. I think I might need that uh, shift. Will that show up? Oh, I got lucky. I got lucky. So we see yes. most of the graph here. And so basically the point is, is that you can very easily have students or yourself um, change that function and you can use your sliders to show everything. And I know some of you are wondering, What's the maximum in? Yeah, I know you're wondering. It will go up to 99 in this case. It's a lot of rectangles there to count, right? And reset will set everything back except for the particular function. Really quickly before Vicky shows you one of her very cool ones here. Um, this is a document that you probably, I don't think you will find on the TI website. It was authored by Dennis Donovan. Dennis Donovan is a, is a T cubed instructor, a long time uh, reader, question leader from the AP uh, reading. And he developed this very sweet and short slope field uh, program. Now you might wonder, well, why? Why do we need slope field? Because the TI Inspire and the 84 will innately uh, graph slope fields. But the problem with the slope fields that the TI Inspire generates is what you'll see here on page 1.3. The slope segments just aren't at nice lattice points. You might see them behaving, oh, fairly nicely for maybe a certain value of y and maybe a certain value of x, but by and large, they just seem to be in locations that are very difficult for students to compute. Now, if we look at Dennis's version, we can just simply input our differential equation here, make sure we use the one after the y to allow the calculator to understand. And page 1.2, isn't that beautiful? You have, lat you have your slope segments at beautiful lattice point locations all throughout the graph. And yes, you can edit within this max math box the differential equation. You can also change the frequency at which the slope fields occur. Right now I'm having them occur for each X value integer, each Y value integer. But there's Y over X, dynamically, page 1.2 is updated. And so we have, uh, it looks like what would be, what, a branch of a hyperbola for this particular problem. And so it's really great to show these on the fly, right? Put a minus in there, what do we have, students? And then you can show them the slope field very quickly. So definitely one of my favorites. Vicky's and gonna I think talk this about is, yes, go ahead. Well, no, one second. Let's talk about this one in just a minute. I think it's really important, even though they will never have to graph a slope field with technology on the AP exam, they will have to hand draw these little uh, tangent pieces on, usually it's like eight, nine, 12 points, at, usually at most. But I just think it's really, important for them to see a, a technology presented slope field to compare to theirs so that they can get a better understanding of am I drawing it the right way um, sort of a self check I mean I tell my students all the time the TI Inspire cast is really sort of a teacher's edition in one way you can check your work and it's, it's very powerful um, for using it in that way yeah sounds great I'm gonna take this back to standard, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then certainly one of my personal goal of the piecewise linear function that's available on the TI website. Vicki, you're gonna talk about this one. Yeah, so I, this one is uh, very powerful for 
thinking about that topic 8.3 with the accumulation, but it also goes back to some topics in Unit 6 where they are using geometry formulas to calculate definite integrals. And so let's look at page 1.2 for just a second. And so what you can do here is those uh, five uh, larger black dots, you can actually move those and create different piecewise linear functions and see what is actually going on there. And then you can also take the two um, open circles that are on the x-axis and change them to represent your A and your uh, upper limit on your integral. In this case, Tony has it at x, and of course we've got the area of a rectangle. Um, but I think this is really good for getting students to just see some different things that can happen with the piecewise linear. But the, the page that I enjoy the most is 2.2, which is actually drawing the antiderivative based on those calculations of the definite integral. And Tony can move that x a little bit, and let's see what it does. Okay, it just shows shows us the corresponding point on the antiderivative graph, basically. The one I really want him to do is, all right, let's leave that one there, move the a value. And I think this is a, a question that you really need to ask your students. What's going on? And I just think this is fantastic for helping students understand that in that accumulation function, changing the lower limit is actually a vertical shift of the solution curve. And this gives them a great visualization of that. And Tony, we're at four minutes to go, so I guess we need we to are. sort of wrap things up here. <laughs> yeah, I think we should. Let's return back to our PowerPoint. I have to catch up with our PowerPoint here because we got kind of ahead of ourselves with some of these That's uh, all right. really fun, fun activities. Uh, Vicki and I have always, we share something in common that we really enjoy creating things for other teachers to use. We, we know how hard it is to teach AP calculus. I guess 78 years of experience between the two of us have kind of taught <laughs> us that. And, and I know the last two years have been, they feel like 10 years uh, in a way. So uh, Vicki has just an amazing repertoire of materials uh, that she has available in her Dropbox here that you can jot this down. Uh, you could take a picture of the QR code. It's a pretty easy URL uh, to remember tinyurl.com, Vicky's AP Calculus, no apostrophe there. And to make things consistent, I have a very similar address that you can uh, visit, of course, and find all sorts of material that you're always welcome to use, uh, modify to your likings, to, to whatever uh, you see fit. And I wanna just say very quickly before I turn it back over to Mike, Vicky Carter is a 46 year veteran of, 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 of teaching and she is going to be retiring at the end of this 2021-22 school year. And uh, it's just been a pleasure working with her. But I know that this is not goodbye because Vicki's gonna be around, I have a feeling, uh, with, with a lot of the things that we're doing with Texas Instruments and, and, and College Board. So I, I, I definitely congratulate Vicki. And, and I also wanna give a shout out to a gentleman in the, in the chat uh, who has uh, 56 years of teaching experience. And so uh, kudos to you, that is absolutely phenomenal. Yes, so it is. Mike, <laughs> Mike, I think it's time maybe to give some stuff away here. Uh, what do you think here? So I'm gonna pass like it. it over to you. And also sometimes I think, you know, I feel I feel old sometimes, and um, I don't know. That that really helps kind of put things in perspective for me. I, I only have a mere uh, 17 years teaching, so I got a ways to go. All right. So as we wrap things up tonight, um, as Tony said, we are giving away to one lucky winner. Uh, their favorite TI graphing calculator, their choice, and tonight's lucky winner is David Highball. So, David, congratulations. We'll be in touch over email in the coming days to get you uh, a little more information and figure out which calculator you're going to be picking. Uh, but, again, huge congrats to David. To receive a certificate of attendance, go ahead and click the link that just appeared in the chat window. Along with that is a link for the documents that were used tonight. And if you're watching this on demand, 
go and copy that link into your browser to receive your certificate. When you leave the webinar tonight, a brief survey will automatically appear in your browser. Your feedback guides us as we plan future online events like this one. And we really hope you share your thoughts in the post webinar survey. Thanks so much to Tony and Vicki. And uh, of course, a huge congrats uh, to Vicki Carter on her pending retirement. And thanks to everyone who joined us tonight. We hope to see you back online next week. Have a great night.